the Eurojet was never really the same ship coming back as it was going out. Um, they were always uh, you know, modifying the ship to make it more efficient. Of course, they could um, repair equipment here and, and, and make spare parts and that sort of thing. Uh, if you were to come out here in the daytime, uh, you, it's a self guided tour in the daytime. You get a pass and you can spend as little as long as you like on the ship. There are simulated ship sounds kind of piped throughout. Right here, you would have machine shop sounds. Um, here, you have the galley sound. They're, they're the only sounds they can't turn off. No one knows where the on-off switch is. <laughs> it's been lost to time. The ship has been a museum since the steps. But uh, they always get a little hungry when they go back. Let's go check it out. her concerns. Frank Knox, the Secretary of the Navy at the time, talked her into it. So there she was, listening to a speech by the original captain of the USS Yorktown CV-5, when seven minutes ahead of time, and for no reason we could think of today, this ship launched herself, all by herself. Now it's unclear if Eleanor Roosevelt knew what was going on, but she doesn't skip a beat. She grabs that bottle of champagne and she starts chasing the ship down the dock. Now she, she, she swings that bottle of champagne at the bow of the ship. It bounces off, falls out of her hand to the deck. She grabs it, and this time with all her might, just, just smashes that bottle of champagne against the bow of the ship, christening the USS Yorktown CV-10, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the original captain of the USS Yorktown CV-5. And from that day forward, the paranormal activity on the ship has just stacked up. Now we're going to go up this ladder. Um, just make sure you're, you're hanging on to the rail. There's always two hands on the rail. Um, when I go down these ladders, I go down backwards, just because it's comfortable for me. The Navy way is facing forward, two hands on the rails. Okay? <laughs> well, that was a, uh, 
when I was a kid, I actually spent the night on the Yorktown. Um, the Patriots Point has this great overnight program for uh, youth groups, usually Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, will spend the night on the ship. Um, today, they sleep in like air-conditioned comfort on mattresses. When I was in the Boy Scouts, we slept here. Uh, we just rolled out our, our sleeping bags and heat or cold, and we just went to bed. Uh, so they're more comfortable than they, they look. But this ship had anywhere from 2,800 to 3,500 men on board. And, and when we were doing research for this tour, there were some things that just stood out to me, some things that, that I was amazed by. Uh, one of those things was the fact that the average age of a sailor on the ship was 19 years old. 19. 85% um, of the men on the ship were volunteers. And, uh, you know, most of these guys were coming from some of the most landlocked states you can think of, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas. And when they were ported for duty aboard the Yorktown, you know, most of these guys had never seen anything this big, much less the ocean. So there was anxiety, fear, excitement. And under those conditions, these men really did try to form uh, a, a family as best they could. I think human beings do that organically um, just to give us a center. Right? Well, uh, these fellows had all the brothers they could want on the Yorktown. Uh, the captain, if not their immediate supervisor, were the father figures. These were older men who told them what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And if they didn't do it, they got in trouble for it. But when we read transcripts um, of the men who served on the ship, when we listen to their audio and watch their video, one thing they say time and time again is that this ship was like their mother. In fact, what they said is they loved the Yorktown like it was their mother. When you think about it, this ship fed them, it clothed them, it rocked them to sleep at night, and it gave them chocolate chip cookies when they were good boys. Everything a mom should do. And what we believe is that when some of these men died, and the stories that we tell tonight on this tour, a lot of them have to do with how these men died, the ones who found the most fellowship, the most purpose, the most joy in life on this ship were the ones it brought back. Indeed, for these men, this was heaven. And, and even men who survived World War II and their military service uh, afterwards and, and died later in life were brought back youth renewed to rejoin their, their brothers here on the Yorktown. The men who served on this ship were, were uh, American heroes, men who dedicated their lives to this country and this ship. And the, the spirits that exist on this ship today, um, we don't think are here to hurt us. But there are some things that can make you hurt yourself this tour, uh, bizarre looking mannequins peering out of display windows around the corner might make you startle and trip. Uh, just watch out for that. I'll you know, try and keep you posted as to, to when we, we come across some of the weirder ones. Uh, but I can tell you that, that we had an investigation on board um, years ago. An amateur investigation group came to this room and set up some equipment. Some of that equipment was uh, Spirit boxes, you guys know what those are? Okay, so, so if you don't know, a spirit box is like a radio that scans the empty frequencies. When you turn it on, you don't hear music, you just hear static. And you would use it like, like this. You'd interview the room. Um, you suspect that there's a spirit here. You would ask that, that spirit, you know, what's your name? How old are you? Um, how did you die? Um, what did you do on the ship? And you're supposed to hear words relevant to what you're static. Well, they weren't getting anything. So they decided to taunt the spirits in this room. Now, this is not you know, a method I employ or endorse in my investigations, but, uh, but it seemed to work okay for them. They played a recording of a woman named Tokyo Rose. Y'all know who that was? Okay, so during World War II, there was a radio station in Japan that broadcast a very powerful radio signal um, that, that the ship could get. Um, and it was a very popular radio station for the men on board because it played all the most popular music of the day. But every day there was a segment with a sweet voiced woman named Toby Owens who would come on and her job was to demoralize the men on the ship by saying, you know, horrible things. Um, things like, uh, you know, the Japanese Navy has captured New York. Now your, your mothers, your sisters, your girlfriends are working for the Japanese Navy. 
And, and yeah, they got a response to that. Uh, two derogatory words about the soul. It's heritage and parentage, and we'll just leave it at that. Now we're going to make a circuit of the room. Um, just look around. Uh, these doors here will show you the facilities where they showered and shaved. They call this the head of the Navy. Also, to notice on, on some of these bumps that they're actual lanes. doctors and surgeons in the third fleet. Um, these guys could handle just about anything that came down the pike. And, uh, you know, the sick bay wasn't just used by the men on the Yorktown, but um, any man in the carrier group that needed advanced facilities like this uh, to treat their wounds. Um, I always hesitate to tell this story. I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyway. Um, but the first man who died on the Yorktown died in this bunk. Now this was the pharmacist aide. He was a kid who he didn't have any medical experience, but he could type, so he could print labels, he could uh, he could he could file, count pills, that kind of thing. He died from body lice. Now, now some of you might be thinking right now, well, well, I didn't think body lice could kill you, and they can't, but you can scratch yourself to death. The, the poor guy died of sepsis, blood poisoning. And, I mean, it was a big deal on the ship. I mean, uh, these sailors had no idea, most of them, what body lice were. These were kids. You know, so all they knew was that, that, that doctors and officers were burning things. And, and you know, when, when uh, you know, kick them up, come, they're, they're not going to say, well, you know, do you mind stopping by the doctor's office? We need to spray down because there's body lice. They would stop a sailor and say, strip. It's, you know, spray them down shave his head and tell him to go on. All these guys knew was that there was an epidemic on the ship and it was deadly. It was terrifying. Well, I guess the, the, the point of the story is if you start feeling itchy in this part of the ship, those are ghost crabs. Okay, now look. Bulldog Tours, I think, partners with some uh, third party that sends out an email whenever you buy an electronic ticket um, and that email asks you to review the tour okay so we love our reviews uh, you know we we always like to know what we can do better um, of course all the good ones I showed to my mother-in-law because I got to have something um, whatever you do when you review this tour don't tell them I told you that story okay I, it's a true story the tour guides tell it we just don't think the people in the shop know we tell it, and we don't think they'd like it that we did. Okay. Um, if you do review the tour, just say ghost crabs, and I'll know it's you. <laughs> right? So let's go this way. Largest battleship uh, in the world was sunk in part by uh, the ninth air group from the York Um I just can't help when I look at this model, think that the guy who built it was single. Let's 
ship uh, lived separately from the sailors. They had very specific duties on, on the ship. Marines were in charge of most of the guns and the gun turrets. They were in charge of the armory and the brig. Uh, they were security escorts for visiting dignitaries, VIPs, admirals, things like that. Um, but the Marines are just a really tough group of people. And, and to drive that point home, in 1945, a 500-pound bomb was dropped on New York Town. Now, this bomb passed through the signal bridge, um, hit turret number seven, which is, which is roughly above our heads here, uh, was deflected off of the ship, where it detonated about 30 feet off the side of the ship, um, um, killing two men, wounding one, who would later die. Uh, as the bomb passed through turret number seven, it amputated the legs of the two Marines who were on that turret. Um, one of those Marines died uh, shortly after getting into sick bay. The other Marine, a very tough individual named Powell Barnett, was still alive when Corman got to him. And at, they were trying to take him off of the gun turret after tourniquet, uh, putting tourniquets on his legs, but he refused. He said, no, you see to the safety of this ship. You make sure this ship is out of danger before you come back to get me. So sure enough, um, they, they left, they secured the ship. By the time they went back to get him, Pal Barnett was still alive, uh, but there were so few men to carry him off of that gun turret that Pal Barnett had to carry his own bottle of blood plasma high above his head. Now they're dragging him through the hangar deck, which is covered in salt water, the fire suppression on the ship. And, and, and once they got Pal Barnett to sick bay, he would you know, spend the rest of that night um, reassuring wounded sailors, regaling the doctors and corpsmen with uh, stories of, of home and family uh, and friends. Unfortunately, at midnight, um, Pal Barnett would succumb to his injuries. Five men died from direct enemy fire on the ship. Um, all in all, 141 men uh, died on, on the Yorktown in almost 30 years of service. And, and those statistics, you know, those casualties are a great tragedy. We mourn the loss. But to give you an idea of how low those casualties were and how lucky the Yorktown really was, um, the USS Franklin, which is another Essex-class carrier like the Yorktown, lost 724 men in a day. Okay. Um, we're going to be moving forward now. To, you know, I just feel compelled to tell you that the paranormal activity does tend to ramp up past this point. Um, but then again, that's really only a problem for the ladies on the tour. So, that's okay. All right, so if you were to get a day pass to Patriots Point, uh, it's all a self-guided tour. You can spend it all day out here if you want, but um, there are like five different tour routes. There are parts of this ship that you will not be able to go to, parts that are barricaded off um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the next section we'll be walking through is one such area. The only reason it's barricaded off is because the room in this section, room 243, uh, is used by staff for overnight stays. I think right now they have Christmas decorations in there. Um, but it's, uh, the, the room is weird. The door won't stay closed. They have a padlock now. But to get it to stay closed, you'd have to wedge it closed with screws or coins or water the pieces of paper or something. The fellow who spent a lot of time in that room there's a guy named Brian Parsons. Brian Parsons still works out here. He uh, was a Boy Scout when he spent the night on the Yorktown, fell in love with it. And, and from that day forward, um, every day in the summer, his mom would drive him to Patriots Point so he could volunteer. When Brian Parsons goes to college, he goes to college for electrical engineering so that he can come back and work on the Yorktown in one of the higher paying positions out here. Um, usually the way that worked was after classes on Friday, Brian would drive down to Patriots Point, finish up, you know, whatever tasks they had for him. And then he'd just stay, stay in room 243. Um, Brian tells us of his first paranormal experience out here. Um, he'd come out here, got his, his, his task done. It was about 11.30 at night. He uh, goes to the room, wedges the door closed with some coins, and he lies down. Brian says that he's still awake um, around 12, 15, 12, 30 when he hears a really loud noise. 
I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> All right, but the door flies open. Coins spray into the room. Uh, it's a step and a half to the door. Brian you know, is, is looking out the hall. There's a chain across this uh, hatch. There's a chain across that hatch. They're not moving. He doesn't hear footsteps. And that night, it was Brian and the security guard, no cameras. So Brian has, has, has told us he's become accustomed to the, the kind of noises and the sights and the sounds, the shadowy figures passing by open hatchways, men dressed in World War II naval uniforms disappearing in front of his eyes. Um, none of that bothers him now because he's sure, as we are, that the spirits on this ship are not here to hurt. There's one place on the ship that Brian won't go. And that's where we're going next. Right this way. All right. So let me uh, shine a light real quick just to get you oriented here. Okay. Don't go through this hatch, but get right up on it. All right, so this is an area of the ship that Brian won't go. Um, there's very little power in this part of the ship, uh, but this is also where a lot of the physical paranormal activity occurs. Um, right beyond here is a, a short corridor and then another hatch that goes into an area that we are trying to develop an investigation in. Um, investigations we usually do uh, as a one-off, they have to be scheduled way in advance. But uh, for the spring, we'd like to start having regular investigations out here that take about two hours. Um, longer investigations, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do. But, um, you know, these investigations have all the equipment, spirit boxes, ghost grids. You guys know what a ghost grid is? Um, think of the laser lights you shine on your house at Christmas time. Just like that. Only a ghost grid is brighter, and the pattern is more regular. Okay, um, and we also have EMF detectors and, and, and other weird things too, um, divining rods and stuff like that. But uh, the area beyond this hatch um, saw some some pretty severe trauma. There's a battle dressing station there um, that has showers in it, um, presumably for burn victims, uh, which is the worst kind of human suffering. Um, and, and all of that suffering and, and pain and loss can, can, can attract sort of otherworldly creatures. And we'll get back to that in a minute. When we do investigations, what we look for are two different kinds of hauntings. We look for a, a residual haunting, which for lack of a better term is the memory of a place, right? It's, it's the events and the emotional energy around those events that are written in the steel of the ship like grooves in a record. And these events can play out for us when conditions are just right. Uh, but they're dumb events, right? They happen regardless of, of where we are or what we're doing. Like a video that plays and rewinds. The other kind of haunting is an intelligent haunting. And that's where there's an entity that's aware of its own existence and can interact with you. This is The Exorcist, The Ring, Insidious, uh, all the Conjuring movies and the Annabelle movies. What's the scariest movie you've ever seen? The Annabelle one. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I hate those movies. Um, and, 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 and this is just the worst kind. This is, this is an entity that can, that can physically interact with us. This is where the poking and the shoving comes from. Uh, we had an amateur investigation group come in um, a while back, different from the ones that were in the cruise quarters. And they used a ghost grid, shined it into this, this room, this darkened room. Um, and the idea is, if something moves in front of the laser beams, it perturbs the light. So they set up a camera behind that, and they caught something. Something bizarre. You guys will see it. sure the sound is down too on my phone because there's some, some expletives in this video. I'm going to show it to you guys 
that I'm going to show to you guys, okay? All right, um, just to tell you, uh, what you don't see in this video that is there is this open hatch you're standing in front of. The ghost grid flattens everything out so you can't see it, but whatever it is, it's coming out of that hatch. Can you guys see the, the lights of the ghost grid? Mm -hmm. Okay, so look right down the middle. is probably about here, look like right down the middle. If you go online and type in the Haunted Your Town or uh, your, your Town Ghost, you're going to get video upon video upon video. Uh, you guys know who the Ghost Hunters were? Yes. Okay, well, they came out here um, in 2012, and they, they got something bizarre on infrared um, in, in the areas that we're, we're going to do investigations. Now, the problem with these areas are is they're dangerous to be in. Um, our investigations, uh, you would have to sign a waiver to take because it's, it's dangerous to be in this, these areas of the ship. We tried to make it as safe as we could. You can't fall into an open hatch 40 feet down. Um, but there are you know, things sticking out of the walls and you know, metal. Everything's made out of steel, so it is, you know, it is a little dangerous. Right? So uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to back out this way. Um, just on the other side of the blue curtain, take a right, and I'll, I'll, I'll be following behind you.
rolling under or crashing into any plane track here. Um, one particularly bad night on the Arctic. It was dark, it was raining, thundering, lightning. Uh, the winds were high and the seas were rolling. Four planes had to be diverted from the much smaller aircraft carrier USS Liscombe Bay to the Yorktown. Uh, the Yorktown's larger flight deck uh, was, was easier for these planes to land on under those conditions. Three of those planes landed fine. One of those planes, the pilot forgot to, to deploy his tail hook. And he realized that the split second he touches down, because he guns his engine, um, revs up to take off and, and, and come around again and do it the right way. Because, the, because of the rolling seas and the way the ship was moving, the effect was that this pilot bounced his plane over the arresting and crashed into and destroyed five planes at the end of the deck, killing five men working on this. Ironically, the pilot survived. These are the kinds of memories that the York Captain has shown.
Now, the, the way that worked is, is once kamikaze planes were within range of a ship, they would drop torpedoes. So then you had two targets. You had one in the air, a plane loaded dynamite with a dedicated pilot, and you had a, a speeding torpedo. Times four, there was virtually nothing you could do to defend yourself against these, you know, against this kind of attack. Something was going to hit your ship. For whatever reason, uh, the, these planes did not drop their torpedoes. Gunners on the Yorktown were able to shoot three of these planes down. Gunners on the USS San Francisco shot the fourth plane down. From that day forward, the men who served on the ship called her the lucky Y. Y for Yorktown. Um, that may have something to do with a blessing bestowed on the ship by a Cherokee Indian chief. So the captain of the Yorktown was Joseph Clark, who was part Cherokee Indian. Uh, and, and actually the first Native American to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. And he had taught his, his tribal chief in coming out and giving a blessing on the ship, which went something like, no more harm would come to the men on this ship than had the men on the original Yorktown. Sure enough, 141 men died on this ship, no more than 141 men died on the on the York County CD5. Okay. You guys get anything on your yep. is that a K meter? K two meter, yeah. K two, yep. Yep. We use those. Yeah, it was just going crazy. Stop now. It, 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 I've seen that happen in other parts of the ship. It's almost like something's passing through it. Right? See it. Yeah. So just on the other side of this red door, they're doing some work in there now. But uh, that's getting into um, um, you know areas of the ship that saw some damage and saw some some, some trauma, right? Some human suffering. Which so, time ever had to go off? Now I'm almost wondering if it is an award officer kind of stuck to this part of the ship. The, this ship was decommissioned after World War II, um, recommissioned in 1953. Um, by 1955, the role of the Yorktown was to hunt and destroy enemy submarines. So they didn't need 500 count bombs anymore. Um, so they didn't, really didn't use this room very much. They ended up putting warrant officers in here um, because warrant officers, this is where their mass was located. Warrant officers were highly regarded um, on, on this ship, they were consultants to admirals and, and captains and, and executive officers uh, for all kinds of things, ship operations, aircraft ordnance. Um, but the fact is, if you weren't an executive officer or a captain or an admiral, they didn't want to talk to you. Um, and they let you know, these were cranky guys. Um, but just to show you how highly regarded they were, you can look in their, in their uh, room and see. Just have a well Yeah, we have This is the break. Yeah, okay. I've been down with the break a lot. You may get something on the K2 meter down here, too. Yeah. Let's stop now. So, uh, some things should look familiar to you here. Uh, we've got a barber shop that looks the same as it does anywhere else. My barber shop looks like that. Uh, Ice Blue Mop with Velva, they still make that. Uh, the green detachment here was security for, well, uh, just the hatch right over here, uh, right behind you, was access to the targeting computer for the nuclear weapons on the ship. Um, so highly, highly top secret, right? Now we're going to go this way, and you can see the ship's store. Ramen noodles were invented in 1958, by the way. Somebody asked me about that the other day. Navy ship now has a soft serve ice cream machine on it. But uh, in World War II, the only ships that, that had the power and capacity um, to, to carry ice cream were aircraft carriers. 
and, and it was this this it was it was well known that aircraft carriers had ice cream to the point where if say a pilot from New York town had to ditch in the ocean, um, if another ship rescued that pilot, um, he would be ransomed back to the York town for ice cream. Right? George H. W. Bush uh, was uh, an Avenger torpedo bomber pilot from World War II, and he crashed in the ocean. Uh, he went for five gallons of ice cream. So, um, but you know, when the ship was in port. Uh, which for this ship was Pearl Harbor, if the men wanted something, you know, a wider variety of treats, they could go on base. Um, if they wanted something exotic, they could go into town. It was on one such foray that men from the Yorktown ran across this little straight dog. Um, now, you know, the legend is that these men looked all over for the dog's owners, couldn't find it. So they did what any 18, 19 year old boy would do who might be missing a pet at home. They put the dog in a trash can and smuggled it on board the ship. Okay, so, so now the ship has this unofficial mascot. The, the men named it Scrapper, Scrapnel, or Scrappy for short. Right, and, uh, the, the guys love this dog. The, the, the pilots were huge fans of the dog. The sailors are always holding back scraps. In their One day the captain hears the dog barking. And he goes nuts. Uh, you know, he rounds the guys up responsible for, for bringing the dog on board. He starts blessing them out. And one of the wise guys uh, in this group of fellows, you know, speaks up and says, well, you know, Captain, we named the dog after you. Um, and he was lying to the captain, but it, it melted the captain's icy heart. So now the ship has a, an official mascot uh, with two names, right? Scrappy and Jocko. Um, Eventually, the piles and puddles started mounting, so the dog was kicked off by the executive officer and adopted by a nice family in the South Pacific. The Boy Scouts who stay on board um, will often tell us they see a Wizard of Oz looking dog roaming around just out of the corner of their eyes. Um, they'll, they'll hear a barking in the early morning hours, the scrape scrape of pets' paws on steel cakes. Uh, this is what you're looking for if you're looking for scrappy. <laughs> that is the scrappy. And I, I have to believe that if, if scrappy does exist, on this ship, that, that it exists on the ship for the same reason spirits of sailors exist on the ship today too, because for a dog off the streets, this had to have been heaven. Sure, there's no grass or trees, but I mean, this dog had all the boys it could play with and all the scraps it could eat, right? Just endless, so. Uh, we're going up to the hangar deck next, so you guys Years ago, we had a young lady on here um, whose dad flew one of these helicopters. This is a Sea King helicopter. Uh, it, it's, it's, they started flying them in 1960. They still fly them today. Uh, every time you see the president getting off of the helicopter, it's a Sea King helicopter. Um, greatly modified and updated, but still basic bones. Um, this young lady wanted to get a picture of the inside of the helicopter. Now, she was kind of small. 
So she ends up doing this. She stands on her tiptoes and she takes a blind photo inside the ship. When she gets home and she sees what she has, she instantly emails us the photograph to, to see if we saw what she saw. You see it? Yep. You do? So there's his head. There's his foot taller. <laughs> so, 1943. And, and, and to be honest, to us, this looks like a World War II bomber pilot. Um, he's got the Type B leather uh, communications helmet. He's got um, the fur collared bomber jacket. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, in 1943, uh, a fellow named Lieutenant Hummel comes on board. Lieutenant Hummel is a competent bomber pilot, uh, but, but couldn't find his way around this ship to save his life. Um, he was constantly late for his, his briefings in the pilot ready rooms, um, and, and this particular incident is no different. He was late for his briefing, gets enough information to be able to come up to the flight deck with the rest of the pilots to begin the mission. Um, right when the mission was supposed to begin, they call it off because of bad weather. At that point, all the pilots are supposed to go back down below uh, to their ready rooms and be debriefed to, to figure out if they're going to do it again, um, if anything had changed. The last time anybody saw Lieutenant Hummel was on the flight deck of this ship. He disappeared. Nobody was ever found. Today, officially, Lieutenant Hummel was one of the 141 casualties on the Yorktown, technically. Is missing in action today. And that's why I always insist that you guys stay with the group. You did a really good job of doing that because I don't want one of you to disappear and end up sitting in the cockpit of any one of these random planes for one of my guests to take a picture of later. Um, now, I think that, that we can go below decks at this point. There's a couple more things I want to show you. Um, they call it the eye patch of the ship, uh, but but there are no windows in this part of the ship. Every bit of information that comes in here uh, is electronic. Um, and and you guys, you guys know why they call it the eye patch of the ship? You guys know why pirates wore eye patches? It's kind of interesting. I'm sure some of them didn't have one on, but. Uh, a pirate generally wore an eye patch so that when he went below decks, he could switch sides. He had one night eye and one day eye. You know what I mean? So that he could see under, he could see, you know, below decks because it was pitch dark. Then when he went back up, he could switch the eye patch again and have day vision. Um, and it helped with the telescope too. But uh, the Apollo mission was not this ship's only encounter with the extraterrestrial. 1966, the Yorktown was escorting uh, a fleet of ships, cargo ships and, and troop carriers up to Antarctica. And men on, on deck reported seeing it was a glowing ball about the size of a Volkswagen. No other uh, indication of detail hovering about a hundred meters over the ship. They were calling to this room furiously. Reports were coming in from all over the ship. These guys didn't see a thing. There was nothing on radar, nothing to indicate that anything was happening at all. This ball of light lit up the entire aircraft carrier. And, and, and as these men were furiously calling, it shot up about 500, 500 meters in the air. The light grew in intensity until it illuminated five square miles. They knew it was five square miles because that's how big the flotilla of ships was. From, from, from the Yorktown to the furthest ship away was, was two and a half miles and two and a half miles in the other direction for the next ship and all of them were lit up. And then this ball of light 
dimmed, dropped back down 100 feet over the Yorktown and disappeared like that. And, and no one's ever been able to figure out what happened. But, but all these guys in here, and some of these guys were, were you know, when hidden intelligence, didn't see a thing, didn't know what happened. So right this way. When we were up in the folks hall, uh, I told you that that area was open to the sea, and it's really hard to picture that. Uh, but here you can see it clear as day. Uh, this is the Yorktown in World War II, and this area just under the front of the flight net is, is that Foxhall area. So you can see how it was, how it was open. Um, they closed that valve in the 1950s when they refitted the Yorktown with the angled deck um, and called it a hurricane valve. Now, what I hope I've done today, I hope I've done two things on this tour. I hope I have inspired you guys to, to learn more about you know, the Yorktown, certainly watch the movie when you get home, um, or, or learn more about stuff like this in your own hometown. But I'd also like to think that when you go home tonight, wherever that is, um, that you find the scariest movie on TV you can find. Mm -hmm. To crawl in the bed and pull the covers up your chin, you watch that scary movie. Or, or play Bloody Mary. That's a dang terrifying game. Turn out the lights and tell her urban legends to fall asleep that night. Um, and here. Before I go, before I we part company here, I'll give you my card. This is my business card. And it, uh, it has my name spelled properly on it. So if you do review the tour, um, you know what my name is. But that card also gives you. Uh, 20% off any additional tour that you do with Post Office. Oh, okay. so, cut that up. so hang on to it. Um, and it, it, it's a reminder to do this. And this is something that I do hope you guys do. Um, during the quarantine, um, how many of you guys worked? Um, so you guys kept the world turning. Turns out, tour guides, non essential. But we couldn't just stay home because you guys were working. We had to give you something. So every day during quarantine at 2 p.m., a tour guide would go out and film a segment 10 to 30 minutes um, at, on location uh, at some historical site. And we told you all about it. And then at 8 p.m. every day during the, the quarantine, we filmed uh, ghost stories in location, right? In some, some really cool places. And all of those were filmed on Facebook Live. So if, if you guys still use Facebook, um, go to Bulldog Tours Facebook page and watch as many of those as you want. And there are a ton of them. Um, and they were labors of love okay, for you guys. And, and they're family friendly, by the way, as well. S uh, schools were calling us, asking us to, to, to do Zoom meetings with their class during the quarantine because I saw a film. So by all means, please enjoy those. Right? Um, and, and follow me. I'll, I'll get you out of here.